when it comes to Pokemon, with each new generation, they like to try something new and shaking things up. With X and Y's Mega Evolutions, with Sun and Moon's Z moves. But with Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu, they decided to do a lot of things differently. And I thought we should take a step back and look at the bigger picture here. So here are the top 10 ways Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu fixes and breaks the norm of the franchise. Now we are going to alternate between fixes and breaks, so to start this list off, we are going to go with... After you beat the main game, you are given the ability to ride one of three Pokemon that can fly over most terrain. This does include most buildings and paths, where the only things that block you are the gates in between most areas, such as the gates of Viridian Forest. It makes traveling so much easier, and so much faster, with the flight speed the fastest travel speed in the game that's now outside flying in between point A to point B like the traditional HM was, with the added bonus of only certain Pokemon able to spawn in the sky as well, including these four. This was a very warm welcome. It made some of the post-game so much easier to deal with, and I do wish they'd bring this back for later titles. Now I can easily make this part one of the longest segments on this list, but for the second time, I'm going to keep it to the nutshell version. Now what they could have done to make this a huge point of entry for beginners is to start with the original 151 during the story, but when they beat it they could easily introduce the evolutions of certain Gen 1 Pokemon, like Scizor, Rhyperior, Steelix, and even certain baby evolutions for the others, like Mime Jr. and Smoochum. It would also be a soft entry for the later gents as well, while showing returning fans that maybe some of their older favorites got upgrades later down the road. If you showed me that Onyx later got this as a form, I would have lost my mind. This as well could extend it to the end game a good bit, Adding more gameplay, getting new forms, overall just a missed opportunity. All I have to say is yes. This has been done before in other Pokemon games, but this is the first one where you can actually interact with them, ride them, or even hug them like a big neighbor of Totoro. And what makes this feel really special is that they are one-to-one -one scale to your character, meaning each Pokemon is the size it's supposed to be, and in combination with a free roaming Pokemon, it feels just so natural. And we all know it's not coming back from the next game, because a fair point was made, seeing that Game Freak would have to make over possibly 900 models for each unique animations. So seeing this making a comeback is a probably not in the future, I'm just glad we got it when we did. With Let's Go Eevee following almost exactly step for step of Pokemon Yellow, it also means it brings out all the drawbacks of a 20 year old Game Boy game. Basically meaning that once you beat the story, you only have two things to do, catch Mewtwo and beat the Battle Masters. Which the latter you might leave as a good excuse to come back to the game, as that is. You can say filling out the Pokedex, but with how the Pokemon are placed and the instant connectivity of Pokemon Go, more than likely you finish your Pokedex with that Mewtwo catch, but there is no new area or other Pokemon to catch where my latter point of sticking to Gen 1 hurts even more. You could have made a bonus endgame content to explore the baby, alternate, or further evolutions of Gen 1 Pokemon. And to finally bring it up, Red and Blue did have a remake before, in Fire Red and Leaf Green. Both did a great job of modernizing the games into the Game Boy Advance era. Better graphics, better in-game content, going to at least Gen 3 after the game was beat, and of course, the Sevi Islands. They didn't add too much content, but enough to keep playing and get more Pokemon since more of the evolutionary items of some Pokemon could only be found there. Not only bringing up those games just reminds us that we know that they can do a full remake good, it just seems that this was an appetizer for the main game to come out later this year. The Pokemon box is located in your bag, with no PC access required to be able to change your Pokemon on the fly. It was so much easier to change Pokemon that I wanted to, or even to change Pokemon when I ran out of revive and needed a fresh Pokemon. It just seemed too much of a hassle to try to dart through a crowded cave, all because you ran out of a potions on the first floor of a 3-4 cave. Anyway, with the ease and access of this, this would be definitely something missed if it wasn't included in future games. A feature we really didn't know we wanted until we got it.
Now there's an unsung difficulty mode selector at the beginning of these games, and you actually pick your difficulty level without even knowing it. In the originals, it was picking your starters, and in the new one, it's picking the version itself that you wanted to play. And all of this boils down to one thing. How early can you get a grass type? Yes, you heard that right. Getting anything pure grass early in the game is playing this game on easy mode. Because when you look at the bigger picture, you can easily get through the first few hours of the game without even trying thanks to an early type advantage. Grass has such a huge, huge type advantage in this region and getting one early on the first route of the game basically sets the game in easy mode for you. I caught a Bellsprout not only on Route 1, it was probably one of the first Pokemon I caught. And I did evolve him to Victory Bell and only making him learn one move outside of his natural moveset once which I kind of skipped over. Not only did he only faint only a fewer than 10 times throughout my playthrough, but he was pretty much the MVP that was one-shotting certain teams, including most of the Elite Four. It was almost to the point it was unfair to the NPCs that they had to face this god of a Pokemon, all because of type advantage. And this isn't the only case of bad placement. If you know where to look, you can actually score a Jatini before Lavender Town, which not only goes with the level you're supposed to be at at the time, but basically means that by the time you get to the Elite Four, you should have a Dragonite. Or maybe even sooner. Pokemon are placed in certain areas to either go with the grind or make certain areas easier, and that really hit a sour note for me. I do understand that these games are more meant for a casual audience, but that's the thing. These games are casual themselves. They can be played by beginners or hardcores no matter what version you play. So forcing this ease of entry even more on this just makes the casual fans just want to drop it even sooner. They were kind of bland in the originals, and yes, even in Fire Red and Leaf Green, on how you just approached the gym leaders and fought them. In here though, they decided to spice things up and give each gym its own special intro based off the leader themselves. Eric is a hedge mage, Koga is a ninja clone guessing game, what? and oh dear lord, Blaine's an actual quiz show! And I was just loving out each second of it. This was a great example of adding something new but familiar. It plays on the theme of gym and their personalities of the leaders themselves. Though the first three were kind of bland, I definitely want to see more quirks like this in Shield and Sword coming up and even in future gens down the road. Now this is going to be weird. Overall, he's not a bad character, but it was the decision in leaving some key plot lines in place that make no sense for his said character, which in turn were meant for Blue. And speaking of which, he felt really, really, really useless in this game. You could have scrapped him out of the whole game and probably be better for it. To be transparent, I am not in favor of this new trend where your rival is a happy-go-lucky best friend! No. I want one of those who's constantly looking to better themselves, pushing themselves just a bit too hard to realize that they might have made a mistake along the way, or even redeem themselves later. I went into a good rant about this live on stream, and I'll just leave you guys a link to the video down below, so you can check it out for yourselves and more raw thoughts about it. But if this is a trend we're going to see for rivals in the future, I'm really not looking forward to beating them in the Pokemon League. Not as a sign of accomplishment, it's more like a box just getting checked of things getting done for the game. What can I say that has been done by countless others? The idea of Pokemon free roaming just seems so much of a natural idea and makes the world feel so much alive. As well, you can actually pick and choose what battles you go into, and even see if the Pokemon you're about to fight is a shiny or not. This feels like another idea we should have had a long time ago and it feels so natural for these games, but at the same time, I can understand why we haven't seen it yet. Just like I said previously, we are facing 800 plus Pokemon, and that's a lot to animate for a game like this. Maybe if they limit to which ones can be seen out in the wild, it might work. But if this would pop up again in future titles, it would be a warm, warm welcome, and it would be sadly missed if it was taken out again. No, 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 no. I hate the throwing mechanic. I hate the fact that the only true real way to guarantee your balls flying in a certain direction is getting it out of the dock. I hate the fact that this flipping system is so... I don't want to cuss on stream. It is so...
damn sensitive. Do I really need to go further? Well, okay. To cap it off, I can understand when there's an option to turn it off, but there isn't. Which really brings this game down a few notches, and is the biggest downside for me. If you do it wrong while trying to catch a legendary, you could possibly end up throwing something like around 60 plus balls and tie your arm out in the process. I really had to take a rest after the stream where I caught Zapdos, where I threw around 80 plus balls and failed to capture him on the first time. This game in the long run was not fun to stream. If there was some way to turn off the motion controls while in docked, my opinion would greatly, greatly change. It might be fun for casuals, and it might even attract some new people, but another downside of the motion controls is that you're forced to only use one Joy-Con, which, depending on your size of your hands, can really make it super uncomfortable. From how the buttons and the analog stick are placed, it is sometimes difficult to even do it one-handed. There's been times where I'm sitting there streaming, and I would have to hold my Joy-Con with two hands to possibly aim things right. If it wasn't for my Elgato cutting off the second I would undock my Switch, I would easily undock my Switch and manually try to catch the Pokemon with the motion controls aiming in the Switch themselves. But sitting here and having to pretend to throw a Pokeball each in an individual time would tire somebody out. What if someone can't really do that? Now if they patch this out later down the road, I might retract this. But until then, this is the number one thing that broke the franchise. Motion controls. We should not be stepping back to 2007 in the Wii era and forcing motion controls into a game that does not have them. But do you know what made it fun? You guys. Everybody who watched it as everything went down. From the fun times to the goofing off, or even finding ways to break the game by finding a Pokemon super early, or finding the perfect life form. All hail the Derpin Bell! Until next time, guys, all hail the Derpin Bell. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share with your friends, be sure to check out the streams every Sunday or Wednesday, check out Junkman Challenge, which will air every Tuesday from now on, and of course, until next time, like I always say, I'm gone, I'm Ghost, I'm out of here, and I'm past tense, and I will see you guys later.